Okay, let's uh, keep going. Um, is there any question about uh, these latest things? There were many questions during the break. They were all nice. Um, let me also make yet uh, another comment about uh, this new matrix that we have obtained. I repeat, is a new solution to the Einstein equation. is uh, not the same solution we had before, but it has a precise meaning. It's uh, the limiting near horizon geometry for this extremal black hole, because while we why we'll, uh, we went to near to the horizon, we also took the extremality limit by sending lambda to zero in the way that is defined in these three boards. So we end up with alias 2 cross 2. It has a lot of symmetry. It should be the relevant geometry for computing the entropy. Now we will see how we can do that. And uh, another good thing of this um, geometry is that the horizon now is still at finite distance and you even even have uh, two horizons uh, let me I just put the type of here there is a square i forgot the square over there. so the other another uh, point is that let's see r equal r plus from this definition here, r equal r plus um, lambda is still finite, corresponds to r tilde equal 1. So equal r equal r plus in these new coordinates corresponds to r tilde equal 1. r equal r minus corresponds to r tilde equal minus 1. Let's see why. Because this is r equal r plus plus lambda r tilde minus 1, but r minus is r plus minus 2 lambda. Do you see? So, uh, if I take r tilde equal minus 1, here I get uh, lambda times minus 2. So I get r plus minus 2 lambda, which is r minus. Is it clear? r plus? Coordinates is r tilde equal 1. r minus in these coordinates is r tilde equal minus 1. Just using this change of coordinate and this definition. But uh, didn't we say that lambda to 0 was r plus 2 r minus? So now what do we do? Plus minus? Yeah, it's exactly the virtue of this limit. That is. Uh, uh, so suppose what I'm saying the here holds for finite lambda. In the limit, the limit has a reminiscence of this because in the matrix here, we still have the two horizons there. Even if we have taken lambda to zero, you can still uh, see that for our tilde equal one or minus one, this piece goes to zero and this piece blows up. So the geometry still looks like a black hole even if you have uh, gone near the horizon. This helps because since the geometry still looks like a black hole, we can do the Euclidean analysis and all that. We will do this later on. So, as it was emphasized, what I just said here is true. True at finite lambda. But uh, there is a remnant of this in the limit, because there I, I still see two horizons for r, t, r, r tilde equal plus one or minus one. So if, even if I'm in the extremal black hole, it seems like if I have two horizons. Of course, the interpretation is no more the same as before. They're not the same inner and outer horizon, or, because I don't have a temperature anymore, and all that. The interpretation is different, but the, the form of the geometry is uh, useful for analyzing the, the, how the entropy arises. True, I find it lambda, but uh, the two, let, let me call these horizons in this way, remain even for lambda equals zero that is at extremality.
Okay, so now I can erase all this. We will just focus on this geometry. Just use that to define our entropy. So what uh, Sen did was to exploit in a wise way the symmetries of ADS2 times uh, S2, but the important one is ADS2, because if the black hole is rotating, the S2 is lost, the SO3 of S2 is lost, um, to, to express the, the world entropy in a more simple way. And then after having done this, also to define the quantum version of this classical uh, computation. So let's keep this in mind. We will use this in a second. And we define the entropy function. Entropy function. So let's be more general than just uh, Maxwell Einstein. We consider, uh, because this we have seen this solution for Maxwell-Einstein. We don't have higher derivative terms in explicitly what we have seen here. But then we have said, now we define extremal black holes in any theory with higher derivative terms, quantum correction, whatever, as black holes that have an ADS2 factor. So Sen wants to use these symmetries to, to define the problem. So arbit consider an arbitrary theory of gravity, consider me arbitrary means that can have a higher derivative corrections. Still classical, we don't do the path integral yet. derivative terms. Then we can also couple the theory to a bunch of gauge fields. Let's consider just U1 gauge field with U1 gauge fields, many possibly. This setup is a setup that is natural in string theory, for instance. You can get gauge fields from the various Ramon Ramon forms, internal symmetries. So with gauge fields, a mu i, where i takes some values. It's not important how many we have. One to the rank, uh, well, let me not specify. We have a bunch of gauge fields uh, labeled by i. And then we can also have scalar fields. Let's, call, let's consider the neutral scalar fields so that uh, we don't have to talk about uh, Higgs mechanisms or so. So now and neutral scalar fields. Phi, I add the label S, but it's totally unimportant, this label. Um, we can have many, many of them. If you think about, uh, so, I don't know, uh, type 2b or type 2a on Calabia or threefolds, the effective theory in uh, four dimensions is a theory, is an abelian gauge, it's, an, uh, it's a supergravity theory of the type that Marco Zagerman was discussing. And uh, in principle, it has gaugings, but it doesn't have any gauging in that situation if you don't have uh, fluxes and, uh, of the internal P forms. And uh, you end up with a bunch of U1 gauge fields associated with the, uh, with the topology, with the different cycles of the Calabia manifold. And you have a bunch of scalar fields that are the moduli of the internal manifold. So this is natural from string theory. String theory on the torus gives this type of uh, um, gravity theories. And we include higher derivative terms here. And uh, there could also be fermion fields, possibly. But the fermion fields in the solution, we will set them to zero. 
fermion fields uh, are also um, possibly there. So that we, this theory could be supersymmetric, for instance. Very good, we, we include that. So it's very general setup. And uh, we write an action. We are still classical, so we can write an action principle, but it will contain all the higher derivative terms that we sketched uh, before and anything else. We assume this Lagrangian is a coordinate invariant and local. We have to assume a few things. So the fact that it is local uh, means that we are not including all possible quantum corrections, but because some quantum corrections due to massless fields uh, running in the loops give rise to non-local terms. So this will come later. So far we have integrated out massive modes, and this gives rise to a, a local effective action. Okay, this is the idea. And... Uh, um, Suppose we are in four dimensions, this can be generalized, but uh, I want to keep it, things not too complicated. And also, the kind of black holes that we consider may be rotating, but here let's consider a, a, a static uh, black hole, so that in addition to a DS2, if we say the black hole is static, uh, it will also be around S2 in the near horizon geometry. It will really be this one, SO2-1 times SO3. If we have rotation, the SO3 is broken to just a U1, the, the angular direction along which you have rotation. So in principle, you may think to reduce the 4D theory on this S2. Think about the Lagrangian as a, as a Lagrangian of a 2D theory containing a, an infinite number of fields. This is Caruza Klein reduction, right? So. I can see this theory as a 4D theory, but since I have a compact space, I may think, okay, I do the dimensional reduction, I go to two dimensions, and uh, all the possible modes, I expand the fields in harmonics on S2, and all the possible modes will be, correspond to one field in uh, 2D. So I have an infinite number of fields because I have an infinite number of harmonics. So we can also think about this as, a, as in this way. So the same action, is the integral of dt, the integral over dr, square root of minus g2, two-dimensional matrix now, L2, where L2 is a two-dimensional Lagrangian, is the integral over the compact space. Let me write S2. It could be something different in principle. It doesn't really need to be an S2 but let's take us to, for the sake of the comparison with what we have done, volume of S2 times the full Lagrangian. So when we define this integral, we have in principle an infinite number of modes, as I said. And this L2, so is a Lagrangian that contains an infinite number of two-dimensional fields and, uh, and defines this two-dimensional action here. Yeah, I have, for simplicity, have this in mind. I haven't said yet that the 2D geometry is ADS2, but I can say the internal geometry is S2. And uh, now I'm going even to say that the, that the geometry we want, we want to consider is this one. Let me erase what is not needed. Maybe I'll just rewrite everything just to... Since we, are, we have this more general theory now, I need to specify all the gauge fields, all the scalar fields. So is it more or less clear what I'm defining here? Is a theory, well, if you have questions, let me know. If it's not very clear, let me know. So now we consider something that we know is a solution, because we can set the scalar fields, the gauge fields, well, not to zero, the gauge field, but the scalar fields to zero, 
And uh, we already know that, uh, or let's assume, if you want, that there is a solution that is this extremal near horizon geometry that is dictated by the symmetries. So impose uh, SO21 times SO3 symmetry. Sorry, I didn't say it. It's, it we don't have a solution yet. We just impose the symmetries of the solution, and we want to then find a solution. But since we are interested in extremal black holes that are static now, uh, we need to impose this symmetry in order to work out what the near horizon geometry is. We don't have the actual solution yet, because we have some parameters to fix. But we know that whatever the solution is, it must have the form that, we, that I just erased, the, that we did, obtained before. must be this. A priori, the size of S2 may be different. This is just limiting near horizon geometry that we obtained before. It's a way to express the ADS2 ge <coughs> uh, geometry, and this is S2. Each comes with its own uh, radius squared, V1 and V2. They control the size of the relative parts of the space. Then we have many gauge fields now. They are labeled by this index i. But the symmetries only allow some form, this form. And the scalar fields, what should they be in this geometry, this homogeneous space? constant, yes. Let me call U as these constants. This, what I'm doing here is just writing down the most general field configuration that is compatible with this SO2,1 times SO3 symmetry. Most general The most general field configuration is compatible with this uh, SO2, 1 times SO3 symmetry. And now we have uh, constants US, constants EI, these are constants, constant PI, they are somehow related to the electric and magnetic charge, but uh, let's give them these names, and constants V1 and V2. All these variables in the squares are constants. All the rest is fixed by the symmetries. Yes? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I see. It follows from SO21 times SO3 symmetry. Okay, I repeat uh, just to clarify this. I assume I have a static uh, near horizon geometry. I infer from this that I must have SO2 uh, sorry, that they must have ADS2 times around S2. This means that they must have SO2,1 times SO3 symmetry. And it follows from this assumption, from this, that the fields take this form. So this is the claim. Yeah, yeah. I will break both. No, just, uh, just uh, the internal one. So can you repeat why the scalar has to be a constant? Well, uh, it's a homogeneous space. Any function in a homogeneous space that respects the symmetries is a constant. It's a group, man. no, it's not a group, it's a coset. It's a coset space. Uh, any function in a coset space that respects the symmetries is a constant. Yeah, okay, to make, to clarify the, the, this, all the comments that if the black hole was not extremal, it was not static, was rotating, 
I could still take the near horizon limit, but I would not have an, a, an S2 in the geometry. I would not have SO3 symmetry. I would just have a one symmetry. In that case, I would not be allowed to write the matrix on a, of a round sphere, sphere here. It would not be the most general configuration compatible with the symmetries. I would just need to write something that only has one symmetry. So this is, uh, is related to the three questions. And it would be much more complicated. Still, the formalism would apply because I would still be able to reduce to 2D with an infinite number of fields. There would be a remnant of this U1 symmetry. I could, I could still do that, reduce to 2D. But there would, it would be much more complicated because I would have less symmetry. So I would have uh, all functions of theta that appear. It has been done by Sen, uh, Trivedi. It's called rotating attractors. But uh, it's a paper called rotating attractors. But uh, I don't want to enter in those complications. The, the ideas are all here already. The formalism extends to these cases. Uh, no, I should write there. Okay, from the point of view, again, to expand a bit on what I just said, you can think this is for the for the geometry for the field configuration. You can think you have reduced to 2D. If you reduce to 2D, this 2 that is in the matrix from the 2D point of view is a scalar field that is fixed to some constant value. This is the size of ADS2 in your 2D space, which is this. This E is the field strength in ADS2 because it is the RDT. It's in your 2D, is a 2D field strength. This P is in the internal geometry, so it's seen as a scalar field or better a flux a coupling constant, because it's, it's always constant, in, uh, in, the, in the 2D theory, seen as a coupling. And this US is, in principle, a scalar field, and in ADS2 it must be a constant. So this remains a scalar field also in 2D. It was a scalar field in 4D, it remains a scalar field in 2D. Okay, now, uh, well, I can continue here because we have defined the field configuration and uh, we plug it into the, La the Lagrangian over there. So, what is the Lagrangian evaluated on ADS2? The 2D Lagrangian evaluated on ADS2. So, there will be V2 out. We have square root of G2, but when we take the determinant of the ADS2 part of the matrix, we have a, uh, no, sorry, the V1, the V2, the V1 comes later, sorry. I still have to, this will appear later. So I have the integral on S2, D theta, D phi. The, the Lagrangian L2 is defined here. I was jumping to this 2D action, but first let's evaluate L2, this, this Lagrangian here. I have to take the volume form of, on S2 times the full Lagrangian. The volume form of S2 contains V2, the square root of the determinant of the matrix of S2, S2 will be controlled by this V2 up there, so it goes out. Then I have the integral of the angular coordinates of S2. Um, here, sin theta, full Lagrangian evaluated on ADS2 times S2, which is the geometry up there. This I'm applying the definition here. This is the Lagrangian. The Lagrangian density is square root of minus G2 L2. So we include now the determinant of the 2D matrix evaluated on ADS2. So it's V1 times L2 evaluated on ADS2. So it is 4 pi V1, V2. The 4 pi comes from integrating over this, the sphere uh, directions. 
And then I need to evaluate my Lagrangian on the field configuration that we have written in that, uh, in that part of the board. Is it clear? It's just, uh, if you want, if you compare what I've done, is the full uh, Lagrangian density integrated over the internal coordinates. Because nothing depends on these internal coordinates because I assume that's so three symmetry. So I can do the integral over the sphere. It just gives me four pi. Then V1 and V2 come from the square root of the determinant of the matrix because I have V1 and V2 up there. And then I just have to evaluate the Lagrangian. So this is the full Lagrangian density. I can also write it here. Full Lagrangian density. Integrated over S2. S2 of radius V2, square root of V2. So what does this function depend on, F? We have a function now that is defined in this way. What does it depend on? V1 and V2, of course, it's written, they are here. So it depends on V. What does it depend on also? The things in the square up there, no? Those things in the square, these variables, are parameters. They will enter in the Lagrangian. We don't know how because it's complicated Lagrangian, but it will be a function of these parameters. It can only be a function of these things, nothing else. So U, V, E, P. Of the values of the scalar fields of V1 and V2, these are V1 and V2, all, of all the possible field strengths E, and all the possible magnetic charges, these internal field strengths P. These are the possible parameters in our very complicated uh, Lagrangian density. There is nothing more than this. Uh, because because uh, it's a, um, let me find the right words. Um, it's uh, since uh, uh, ADS2 is maximally symmetric, whatever, if the Lagrangian is coordinate uh, invariant, it does not depend, uh, it's again a function on ADS2. For the same reason that I was saying before, it must be a constant, because it's a maximally symmetric space. It's a homogeneous space, a function on a homogeneous space must be a constant, so it cannot depend on the coordinates. So this L is not L of T and R. It's not. Because of the symmetries. But not really. We will do this later. For now, we are computing what uh, Sen calls the entropy function. I wanted to follow his reasoning. I could have jumped to the Onshell action immediately. But the, the Onshell action <coughs> requires regularizing the ADS2 volume. But I'm smartly, I mean, following Sen, not integrating over the ADS2 directions. But since I have a, a, enough symmetry, I know that this, nothing of here depends on R and T. So I don't really need to integrate because nothing depends on that. Yes, yes, that's why I always write this like this. It's evaluated on the solution, exactly. Where do we get the dependence on E and T? Just to make it more specific, it's not evaluated on a solution yet because I've not solved the equations of motion, but it's evaluated on a field configuration that has these symmetries. Now I'm going to solve the equations of motion. It will be then the on-shell Lagrangian, more or less. Is Lagrangian of past matter? Matter, yeah, yeah. Matter field, scalar fields. But the scalar fields must be constant. There is a scalar potential, but uh, it must be a constant. So it's a function of these constants U. So last step, we have this function small f. We introduce another function, which is E, curly E, is U function of the same parameters, U, V, E, P, Q which is 2 pi 
I've introduced a new variable, Q. There are as many Qs as Es, as many gauge fields. It's E I Q I minus F. And this is called entropy function. So what did we do? We nothing. We took F and we shifted f by e times q, where q is a new, new variable. It, it's not uh, explicit there. q is introduced here. And this is called entropy function. Sorry? It's, uh, it will come. The Legend transformation will come. But for now, let's not even think about that. It's correct. It's related to a Legend transform, but... Uh, it will come later. So here, now we have many parameters. But so u, v, and e should be seen as variables. P and Q instead should be seen as parameters. I'm going to explain this in a second. But in order to explain this, let's see what is the claim. This function is made to be extremized because it's basically the Lagrangian is not yet a non-shell Lagrangian, because we have not made sure that the equations of motion are satisfied. We have just imposed some symmetries. We have defined a function that depends on parameters instead of fields. But we have not imposed the equations of motion. Now, the observation is that extremization of this, that is basically the Lagrangian, corresponds to imposing equations of motion. So, if I do d e over d v1, and I extremize it with respect to v1 and v2. This is like imposing the Einstein equation. Then extremization with respect to u, us, will be equivalent to what? Imposing, yeah, Klein Gordon, scalar field equations. You may try to impose Maxwell, but in this, in this geometry, the Maxwell equations are automatically satisfied, at least the, at least the ones we, we are familiar with, d star f equals 0, is satisfied in this uh, geometry. But still, if you impose extremization with respect to e, e i, you impose the Gauss law. You are imposing, so I can say, if I look at here, what I'm doing here is just saying that QI are the variation of with respect to these field strengths. So this is telling me that QI are the electric charges. So this is the integrated version of the Maxwell equation. This comes from the fact that, in general, the charge Q is defined as the integral over S2 of the variation of the action with respect to the field strength, uh, RT, in general. And here I'm doing Q is equal to the variation of the Lagrangian. F was the Lagrangian density with respect to E, and E are the field strengths, uh, the part of the field strengths along R and T. Okay, so I'm, I'm defining what are the electric charges. So you see why V1, V2, U, and E are variables. They are the variables with respect to which I extremize. P and Q should not be seen as variables. I don't have to find a solution for them. They are the parameters that I stick in. I decide what are the charge, and uh, P corresponds to a magnetic charge. You see it's an internal part of the gauge field. 
the electric and magnetic charge of uh, my solution. So P and Q are parameters, the rest are variables for which I have to find a solution by solving this. So from this, solve, and you find uh, V equal V star, uh, U equal U star, you s find solutions for this, E equal E star. So it's a bit uh, implicit here, but if you, have, if you give me a theory, I can do this in all steps, very explicitly. There is no mystery, no confusion. Now I have solved, I can evaluate E, I define E star, that is the entropy function on the solution, and uh, it is defined, this will depend on the parameters P and Q, and this is defined as the entropy function on the solution, so on U star of PQ. So these solutions will depend on the parameters P and Q. So V star of PQ, E star of PQ, PQ. And now we have evaluated this entropy function at the extremum. So we have made sure that all the equations of motion are satisfied, so we have a solution now. ADS2 times S2 now is a solution of the equations of motion. And we have extremized this function, E star, and uh, what this function will be, what it respond to. Sen shows that this is the world entropy. So the world entropy defined as the variation of the action with respect to the Riemann tensor is nothing but this function. Um, I'm not going to show this. It seems this, this equality here may seem either trivial or uh, mysterious, or uh, either obscure or, obscure or too trivial. But uh, there is work to show this. There is work. It's in the, I gave the references where Sen shows this. There is work because the theory may be a complicated higher derivative theory. It's not uh, just Reisner, Einstein, Maxwell, and nothing else. But it, it, it's also easy to interpret from our point of view because basically this entropy function is very closely related to the Onshell action. And we saw that the Onshell action was the grand canonical partition function, but if we do the appropriate Legend transformation so, so that it becomes a function of charges of the chemical potentials, is the microcanonical on, on Schlag, and it must be the entropy. I'm going to show this in the remaining part of the lecture, so that there is a relation with the Euclidean approach. But uh, the way this was first derived is via this reasoning, without really computing an on action yet. But so the reason why it makes sense, it is, it's because secretly this is a, the appropriate partition function, the appropriate saddle point of the gravitational partition function with the appropriate microcanonical boundary conditions, where I fix the charges and I let the rest fluctuate. This is what I will test, uh, but it's just to give you a meaning of why this can possibly be the entropy in any theory of higher derivative uh, with higher derivative terms. Is there any question about this? So in the notes, it's also taken from Sen's uh, review, uh, there is an application of this entropy function to Reisner Nostrum, but I'm not going to try to do this as an exercise. It's a very simple case because I just take the Einstein-Maxwell theory to derivative. I would, know how, I would already know how to compute the entropy there. But uh, you can follow these steps, this formalism, all the steps, find the quantum entropy function, sorry, the classical entropy function for uh, Reisner Nostrum, and you find that it coincides with uh, what uh, we know already. So you, you can check that it works for the extremal Reisner Nostrum black hole, and um, is explicitly given in the notes. So let's skip this because there's no need to go through these details now, but it works out. And it works out more generally. It's all the work so it will always satisfy the first law. Uh, a, a remark that is useful to make 
is the connection with the attractor mechanism. So let me say this in words. So the attractor mechanism is a feature that was observed first by Ferrara, Kalosh, and Strominger in the mid-90s. Uh, it's a feature of uh, supersymmetric and extremely calls in supergravity super theories that uh, the values of the scalar fields and um, also other near horizon properties, the values of the scalar fields at the horizon do not depend on the values taken at infinity. So let's come back to this situation of, for instance, type 2A or type 2B on Calabi-Yau manifolds. I have scalar fields, but the Minkowski, so, so there is a solution that is Minkowski, flat space, times Calabi-Yau. And in this Minkowski solution, there are many scalar fields. They can take any constant value. I always, there, is, there are flat directions of the potential. There is no potential. In, the theory is not gauged. There is no potential. <laughs> So the scalar fields can take whatever value they want. So these are called the moduli. They correspond to different shapes of the Calabi-Yau. And there is no reason for thinking that one is more or less energetic than the other. So these are moduli. And uh, uh, the values of this moduli in Minkowski is arbitrary. In the black hole solution, the value is not arbitrary because the black hole creates a potential for them. But it's arbitrary at infinity because the black hole is asymptotically flat. At infinity is like being in Minkowski space. The value of the moduli at infinity is, ar is arbitrary. So in the black hole geometry, I have a scalar fields phi that flow. Their value at infinity uh, is not fixed. They can take many different values at infinity, but when you go near the horizon, they are attracted to some point, to some value, fixed value. This is the attractor mechanism. And in particular, the, the feature that is most important is that the black hole does not depend on the moduli. I should be a bit careful in the way I, I state this. It's uh, written a bit more precisely in, in, the, in the notes. Uh, so the aim in the entropy function story that the fields phi that enter in the entropy function uh, such their value at infinity never affects the extremization problem. There may be other fields phi that don't enter in the entropy function. They can, they may not be fixed at the at the horizon. Let me just say a bit. Without being too much precise, the, the, the idea is that the value of the fields at infinity um, does not affect the entropy. And here you see it very clearly. Whatever we have done was just done near the horizon. It's as simple as that. So this is a generalization of the attractor mechanism that was first observed in supergravity. Whatever we have done here only knows about the near horizon geometry, doesn't care at all about the values of the fields at infinity. So we have proven and generalized this attractor mechanism by these simple arguments. In particular, the fact that the entropy does not depend on these moduli, on these parameters. Yeah, there would not be a moduli anymore. If the compactification is more complicated, first you have to give me the geometry and then I tell you what are the moduli. No, they are not moduli anymore, so they are already fixed at infinity. So they are already fixed. Probably they, they may not even flow. They may not participate in the extremization problem. Maybe they do flow. I don't know. It depends on the situation. But what the claim regards the fact that in asymptotically flat spaces, typically at infinity, the value of the scalar fields does, is not fixed because there is no potential in asymptotically flat space. And so I have many moduli. It's the issue with Calabi-Yau compactification, so there are all these many moduli. They may be interesting or not, but for sure they don't affect the entropy problem. Okay, so this was one comment. So maybe I would take the break now, because now I want to make as a final... There are many details in the note. I will be a bit more quick. Uh, the relation with the computation of the Onshell action, so with the Euclidean approach, just to close the circles now, 
then defining the quantum version of this, which is still classical, and, uh, and with some comments of, on ADA-CFT. So, okay, let's stop for 10 minutes. We start at 35 or so. So, okay, let's uh, start again. I'm staring a bit at the notes to see where I've given a rather detailed discussion in the notes about what I'm going to say now. That is taken, again, from sense, work, sense, review. And, uh, and uh, it is um, mm, quite detailed, so probably it's not worth to go through all the details now. It, I'd rather do some gener more general comments and uh, answer the questions in case there are. Um, but you can find a more detailed discussion. So if what I'm saying, I'm going to say now is a bit obscure, maybe try to then read the notes they, or just uh, send me an email or something. So I'm not going to do all the details of what I wanted to say. So the idea now is to first relate this entropy function that we have found to the on-shell action, because in this way we go back to our Euclidean understanding of uh, the partition function, and uh, we know that the Euclidean on-shell action is a saddle point of the gravitational path integral. So then starting from that, it will not be too hard to define the gravitational path integral that computes the entropy. The entropy. So that's the idea. So first we try to see the relation. So the topic of... The topic of this is the relation of the entropy function with the Euclidean on shell action. So let me say the idea in words. Basically, we have computing this Lagrange. We are computing. We have computed this Lagrangian density f, which is a, it, neither the action nor the Lagrangian density, because we integrated over the angular coordinates theta and phi, and not along time and radial coordinate. So, if we really want the action, we still have to integrate over time and radial coordinate. But the radial coordinate uh, in uh, this ADS2 geometry. Uh, is infinite, is unbounded, so there is the issue of infinite volume of ADS2. This is one issue. Another issue is that uh, the time direction a priori is not compactified, but, and so also this integral may not be well defined. But uh, in this geometry, uh, thanks to this uh, nice limit that we took, the solution ADS2 looks like a black hole. This is the, um, the advantage of taking this particular limit, because ADS2, we already saw that the near horizon was ADS2, but the fact of having done it in this way, so that we have as R squared minus 1, means that uh, when we take R equal plus 1, this looks like the horizon of a black hole. We are in Euclidean signature, is where the space ends. Okay, so even if we are near the horizon, it seems we can apply the same Euclidean reasoning as we did for Schwarzschild. It's non-trivial, this, and uh, indeed, uh, when Sam first defines the entropy function, 2004, roughly, he, he didn't have this specific analysis and didn't immediately have the relation with the Euclidean approach. Later on, he... I don't know exactly how, but it found this kind of limit. And here it's easier to do the relation with the uh, Euclidean approach because we have regularity conditions uh, on time in particular. See, uh, we have, um, if, I write the, if I write the Euclidean version of that, uh, well, let me just change t in i tau minus i tau here. So I do this, this becomes plus, 
d tau squared. And this t becomes uh, minus i d tau. Nothing else changes. Nothing else changes. There is not such a big. Uh, it's not a big deal. But now we see that this space shrinks in r equal one. R equal one comes before R, R equal minus one, so we consider R equal one. We start from infinity, we go down to R equal one. And so for this geometry to be a good geometry, you can still do the near horizon limit. Uh, um, maybe it's confusing because there is a one over R square minus one here. So let's really do the change of coordinates that brings you to a more familiar matrix. So you can take R equal cosh eta new coordinate eta. Then the, the ADS2, um, ADS2 part of the matrix that is there becomes V1 times sinh squared eta d uh, tau squared plus d eta squared. It's again the same matrix, just in different coordinates. And you see that when I take eta to zero, close to eta to zero, eta equals zero corresponds to r equal one in this change of coordinates. Okay, when I take eta close to zero, so that I approach uh, this uh, would be horizon in r equal one, this matrix is approximated by v1 is roughly eta squared d tau squared plus d eta squared plus dot dot dot. And this is the, the matrix on flat space in polar coordinates. So I have to take tau identified up to 2 pi. So tau is identified up to 2, two pi. And this was not, uh, would not have been obvious if I didn't take this specific limit where I sort of have a, uh, where the space is closes off at, at finite distance. So the point here is that the space ends at finite distance. So I can implement this uh, reasoning. I conclude that uh, the the length of the time circle is just uh, 2 pi, and the integral over uh, d tau will give 2 pi. Uh, uh, we have a temperature, not really, but it seems like we are Euclid. This Euclidean uh, evaluation doesn't have the interpretation of a temperature. You can think you have the temperature. Uh, yeah, I know, but it's a feature of this limit. You could, I think you could scale this away. You could scale this as you want by changing something else. It's, uh, it's not really fixed, but it helps to do the analysis to, to keep this fixed. I'm, I'm claiming that this, it's a sort of, a, it means that this 2 pi is not really a temperature because I can scale it in an, uh, to any value I want, but uh, it helps to, to, to choose a sort of scheme, maybe in the sense you had in mind, in which this is the radius of tau, and in this way I'm able to do the integrals. That's my, my issue, that I need to integrate over the ADS2, so I need to define the volume of ADS, the Euclidean ADS2. Euclidean ADS2 here is the disk. It's like a disk, if I include the boundary, I assume the boundary is at finite distance, it's like the metric on a hyperbolic disk, this. It's infinite, but I, if I include the boundary, is the disk. So ADS2 should be seen in particular. This is the boundary. Eta is infinity. Eta is zero is in the middle. And so this also helps in understanding how to perform the integration over R. I regularize a bit uh, the, the space. I, I take eta, eta zero large, but not infinite and I will perform the integration over the radial coordinate. So instead of eta zero, I come back to R zero. I come back to our coordinate R zero, but with, with the insight that tau is identified up to two pi. So in, in order, so this allows us to compute that the integral in d tau gives just two pi. Then we need to do the integration over, let's say integration over dr, what is this? Uh, it is an integration between one, because the minimal value of r is one, is where this space ends. Or in this, in this picture, is eta equals zero, is the center of ADS. 
and uh, and then the, I want to regularize the space so that the volume is not infinite and I put a maximum value of R0 that corresponds to a maximum value of eta0 in these other coordinates but I will express the result in the R0 coordinate so the integration over R is this integration that gives a finite result again because it's between 1 and R0 Yeah, yeah, you have to remove the R0, it's an issue of boundary terms. No, R, yeah, R0 means that you send uh, eta0 or R0 to infinity, because this, this boundary that I'm drawing here is at infinite uh, value, it's uh, eta equal infinity actually. No, no, yeah, you are, you are saying that in principle the action will yeah. depend on R0. I'm going to show this. The action will depend on R0, but as we did uh, in the other cases, I need to cook up some good boundary terms that remove the divergences. It's always the issue of renormalizing these divergences. It's long distance divergences, not quantum short distance divergences. It's, a, it's an art, as I said. But it must be done with uh, some rules that you only introduce local terms that are gauge invariant and so on. And you can show that you can, let me show this in a few formulae. So I, again, I emphasize the philosophy. The philosophy is that we, we are evaluating a non-shell action now because it's the saddle point of some gravitational path integral. The non-shell action is basically this uh, L2 the 2D Lagrangian density, that is F, integrated in dr dt. That is what I'm doing now. So if I do that, I erase, but remember this F is the, the Lagrangian density in 2D. Um, so before erasing it, I define I bulk the 2D action is minus the Euclidean one d tau dr square root of G2 L2. You see, it's basically this F in the Euclidean setup evaluated on ADS2. So it's just minus the integral of d tau dr F, where tau is uh, IT, as we know. And then, as it, it has been remarked, I need, to, I need to expect that this is regularized, but if I remove the cutoff, this will give infinite. So we can even, we, let's already see what it is, is minus 2 pi. I said f does not depend neither on t nor on uh, r, so I just have to integrate between, uh, these integrals are between 0 and 2 pi, and between 1 and r0. So I get R0 minus 1 times F. Okay. Super naive integration, but regularized. I have R0, I still have control on, on what would be the infinite volume if I send uh, R0 to infinity. So I call this I bulk because it's not the full on shell action. Now we need to introduce boundary term to a boundary term to renormalize this. So I bulk will be supplemented by I bulk boundary. And I'm not going to specify what are these boundary terms, but so the analysis of SEN shows that these boundary terms, whatever they are, uh, if they are local, so they are terms defined at the boundary of ADS2, no? on the circle at uh, radius R0. If you assume that they are local and gauge, then, let me see. then this mean, means that I boundary can be something of order R0 plus something of order R0 minus 1. There can be nothing of order 1. It's uh, an argument, there is an argument that shows this. I'm not going to reproduce it here. So the, without being too explicit, we can say I fix my boundary terms 
in uh, the correct way for removing the divergence. This goes away. I can uh, remove it by a local boundary term um, as long as I tune it in an appropriate way. And this will not affect the finite term because the other piece in the boundary term is uh, subleading. When I send the cutoff to infinity, it goes away. So I, I, do, I totally don't care about this. I care about this in order that I remove the divergence. So the result is that IE, after doing this, is that uh, is uh, 2 pi f. Yeah, I choose, I tune them so that this happens. Maybe a more systematic analysis could, could be done by saying that the only local terms are such that the divergence is cancelled, but let's not care about that. I, I choose them so that the divergence is cancelled, and I know that anyway they don't affect the finite answer. So the non-ambiguous part and finite is this one, is 2 pi f. It's non-ambiguous because it's not affecting boundary terms. Non-ambiguous. And you see it starts resembling, resembling the entropy function, including the 2 pi. So this, uh, if I want this to be really the on-shell action, I have to evaluate this ex at the extremum. I have to solve for the, implement the Einstein equations, extremize this. Okay, and remember, just to also be more explicit, this, after I implement the extremization, is a function of E and P. I have not done the Jean transform. I have not introduced the other variables Q that were in the entropy function. This F is really the Onshell action, and the Onshell action can only depend on these parameters here. You see all this. Then I extremize with respect to V1, V2. This V1, U, and V, our, our, my scalar fields in 2D, I extremize, I solve for them, I plug it back, and the parameters that remain are still E and P so far. Then I still have to extremize with respect to E, but this came when I introduced the function curly E. So I could say two things. No, I still have to say another thing first. I mean, what's the idea here? This is the Onshell action. It depends on P, magnetic charge, but it still depends on this E. And we know the entropy function had this other variable Q instead. So we were extremizing the entropy function with respect to E in order to obtain a function of Q and P only. So basically, we should do this here as well. We could do Q times E minus I Euclidean and then extremize E with respect to E, and this would be give Q, and then I plug the solution back, and I obtain the entropy. It is correct, but we want to understand this from the Euclidean point of view. Why do we, do we need to do this sort of lesion transformation? The idea should be that this E is the chemical potential, capital Phi, associated with electric charge. This would be the idea. If I have the the, a function that is grand canonical with respect to the chemical potential, electrostatic potential E, then I do the Legion transform and I obtain the, obtain the entropy that is just a function of uh, Q and P. But the point is that we have not understood yet that this E is a chemical potential because this E appears in the field strength here. This appears in the field strength. While when we define the chemical potential, the electrostatic potential, it was phi dt. So phi d tau, it was this. So this clearly does not affect the field strength. This f does not depend uh, on, on this phi. So it, it seems that this e 
uh, okay, it's a, it appears here, but it's not the chemical potential. So I don't have the interpretation of switching from grand canonical to micro canonical partition function. So the point again, this is a subtle point maybe, the point again is, the ge is that the geometry is this. So here I defined F, but I didn't give you A. So A, and now I give it to you. Um, let me just look. I just look at this part of a. This part is uh, internal fields. Let, let me not not write it. I could write it. The rest. This is what is important: is that A has this piece E times R, so that uh, so that uh, I ob obtain this field strength. Okay, but I'm adding this by hand minus one times d tau. This I'm adding by hand. It's a, it's a constant piece, so it certainly does not affect the field strength. But I need to add it by regularity. This is imposed by regularity because when I go from R to infinity to, to R equal 1, I need that whatever has a component along d tau goes away. So this minus 1 is imposed by regularity of the geometry in this geometry, so in this specific geometry. So you see that uh, it is true, we introduced E as a piece of the field strength, but by this condition, it's also related, by this regularity condition, is related to the chemical potential, the, the constant part in the gauge field. So E, because of this, is actually the chemical potential as well. The, this parameter, because of regularity, is the chemical potential. And so it makes sense now to interpret this partition function as grand canonical with respect to the electric charge is already micro canonical with respect to the magnetic one. But my grand canonical with respect to the electric charge, I do the Legendre transform, I obtain the micro canonical partition function is the entropy. So this is gives the interpretation of E star as the appropriate uh, the appropriate Euclidean action that gives the entropy. Let me also rephrase, is there any question about this? Maybe I was a bit fast. E times R remains there and uh, it controls the charge. <coughs> it controls the charge. If you do the exercise for Reisner Nostrum, you will see that uh, E is also equal to the charge actually. So here I should have written somehow if I wanted to be a posteriori, let's say I should write minus i q r d tau in the case of Reisner Nostrum, q r d tau uh, minus e d tau. I could do this. So this would be e would be the chemical potential, q would be the charge. It turns out to be the case for Reisner Nostrum. More generally, the charge is related by some linear transformation to the e that appear here, to the field strengths. Details in the notes. Mm, it's a bit subtle, but it's not super important, this fact. In the end, yes. In the end, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, upon this Legion transformation. Yeah, somehow, yes. No. As a function of the charges, I don't think you change the entropy. It would be the same function. If you fix the charges Q and P to be Q and P, I don't think you... Yeah, but I don't know, Q and P will change. The, the way, I don't think... Um, uh, 
I don't know, maybe there would be a factor that is uh, spit out of here uh, so that this is no more 2 pi, but some, something else. But the final result for E star will only depend on the parameters QP, not on this extra parameter that you may introduce by rescaling the length of the time circle. This is certainly true. I, I know it's not visible, and I'm not yes. motivated in this, but I know it's the conclusion. So, yeah, sorry, at this level, let me be a bit more. Uh, All right. How is a <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. I in the no, right, yes, that's correct. But yeah, it was a bit an artifact that I put. Uh, yeah, indeed, I think the length of tau can be rescaled into this V1 and V2 if you want. Yeah, that uh, I'm extremizing and they are not parameter in the final in the solution. So I think these lengths wouldn't wouldn't matter. It's implicit here. I agree. It's not immediately visible. So in order to define the quantum entropy, I have to make yet one step, one step more. So one thing would be to say. So what have we done so far? We have inter now found an interpretation to the entropy function. First, we interpreted this function f star as a function that is the shell action that is microcanonical with respect to the magnetic charges and grand canonical with respect to electric uh, charge. And in order to obtain the fully microcanonical partition function, we need the, of the log of that. We need to we need to perform a Legion transformation. This is. Fine. So if we wanted to define a gravitational path integral, we would just say that we have a Z that is uh, the path integral over all fields, including the metric and whatever, all the possible fields that I have in my area, the higher derivative theory, of minus I, this, uh, this 2D Lagrangian renormalized. With the appropriate bound, I cannot impose this is already ADS2. So I'm a bit sch I'm schematic here. I'm not imposing ADS2 yet. With ADS2 boundary conditions, we fix the ADS2 boundary conditions. We let the field, uh, the field fluctuate. But this, in the end, will give us Z of E and P. Now there is a subtlety that uh, is related to the fact that uh, of the boundary condition for the gauge field that uh, I would prefer not to discuss uh, because it would take all the time. Um, this fact that uh, you have a function that is grand canonical with respect to an electric field is what we, we have seen so far because it made a lot of sense. So the gauge field is uh, something like Q R D T plus constant E, let me call it phi uh, D T in general in ADS. Usually it makes sense to keep this boundary condition so that this is fixed at the, at the boundary and let this that controls the field strength, so the derivative of the gauge field, uh, free. These are the usual sort of Dirichlet boundary conditions. It makes sense usually in ADS space because this in other dimensions is something like A, A2, over R squared. It, it decays at infinity. In other ADS spaces of higher dimensions, ADS5, ADS4, ADS3 is more tricky, but ADS5, ADS4, this other mode is normalizable. So the charge is the normalizable mode and the chemical potential is the non-normalizable one. Here is the opposite because this dominates, this grows, and this remains constant. So in ADS2, it's tricky to, to impose these boundary conditions because we, we need, uh, we would have, a, we would be fixing a, normal, a subleading mode, a normalizable mode, and let fluctuate in the path integral this one, which is big. And this is not well defined. So we would need to do something else. This something else is implementing this Legion transformation in the, in the path integral. So what we can do is to kill the, Sorry, what we can do when you want to change from Dirichlet to Neumann boundary you can add some boundary term that switches from one to the other. Okay, so let's do this here, uh, again, a bit schematically. I change the definition of my on-shell action.
I do this. I change the definition of the action, but just by a boundary term. This is at the boundary, is on S, the S1 uh, of the radius R0 in the regularized uh, action. I change what I had so far. I add this boundary term. And you can see that this boundary term is such that it precisely switches the boundary conditions. When you vary the action, the variation of the gauge field is offset by the variation of this, exactly. And uh, it implements the other boundary conditions, where you keep the normalizable mode uh, fluctuating and the non-normalizable mode, that is the charged, fixed. And you can see, again, a bit schematically, that this is uh, basically what I called phi, or E. So you see I'm doing precisely, again, just trust me, let's just try to follow what comes out. Is, uh, what you get is, uh, um, minus 2 pi, E i, Q i minus F. So the F, F star, so f was this, remember, we, we have computed it over there. It's 2 pi f, is this. But I'm saying this doesn't have the good boundary conditions, the, the good boundary problem. doesn't define the good variational problem because of the boundary conditions. I add this term that changes the boundary conditions. It uh, reverses the boundary conditions. It's like saying I'm fixing the charge instead of fixing uh, the electrostatic potential. If you think a little bit about that more, uh, with some more time, you will see this is the case. So you add this boundary term, you switch the boundary conditions. This term evaluates to this, because when I integrate on the, in the tau, I have 2 pi, q is already there, and the integral of the finite part, here I have to remove a divergence, let me forget that. I remove the divergence, the finite part is just e because I gave you the gauge field here. The finite part is just proportional to E. So I'm left with this, and this is telling me that this new I hat is precisely, precisely, with the minus sign, because this should be minus the entropy, is a minus the entropy, which is a function of P and Q. Minus S volt. So in this prescription, In this prescription, we are computing the microcanonical partition function directly without doing the Legendre transform. The Legendre transform is already there. Is, um, is this E times Q F? At the saddle point, we'll implement the Legendre transformation. So I have that uh, Z micro is E to the minus I E hat now, which is just e to the s world, e to the e star, if you want, which is, by sense, reasoning is s world. So, you see, we have a, this is a function of p and q. This is a function of p and q. So we have that s world is the log of this on shellac, particular on shell action with this Wilson, with this uh, holonomy of the gauge field that implements the change of boundary conditions. Uh, okay, so it looks it looks inspiring, and then what Sen did was to say, okay, let's promote this to a quantum path integral. Now this emerges as a saddle point in the in the saddle point approximation. I'm just computing a classical on shell action. It's the saddle point of the path integral. But if I compute the full path integral with the boundary conditions, this one, but we, for the head, this is the full uh, <coughs> microcanonical and quantum partition function, which is the entropy. The, the log of this is the entropy. This is e to the s quantum. No more, just world the full quantum entropy. This is the integration, path integral over all the fields that I may have, e to the minus 
e hat, which is the integral of del phi, e to the minus the original action uh, plus this uh, uh, minus i to i, the integration of d tau a at the boundary. And this I can see as the expectation value of e to the minus i q i uh, integral of Okay, what did I write here? I took what was the saddle point approximation and I promoted it to the full path integral. The microcanonical quantum partition function, which will be a function of the P and Q electrical magnetic charges, is a path integral for this hatted, uh, hatted, uh, on -shell action. Oh, a hatted action. It's not on shell anymore because to do the path integral I need to allow the fluctuations. So I, then I expand what is I had compared to the original action. I have this extra term that is like inserting this holonomy of the gauge field at the boundary, which to change the boundary conditions from grand canonical to micro canonical. And the expression value means that I need to compute this path integral. It's just one way of saying that. It's the expectation value of this Wilson line with ADS2 boundary conditions. So it, I don't fix the metric. The metric must be allowed to fluctuate, but I fix the boundary conditions that are ADS2 boundary conditions. And finite means that I need to regularize the, the, the R0 divergences in the way I sketched here. So there is a prescription similar to what uh, I just uh, sketched that allows you to introduce boundary terms so that you remove the divergences that uh, that would make this infinite. So there is this prescription so that you are just uh, keeping the finite term, even in the quantum computation. All the time you will get R0 showing up and then you remove it by boundary term. Then uh, you do another loop. Maybe if you do loop expansion, you get another R0, you remove it by boundary term and so on. So you choose boundary term so that the result is finite. And this is sense quantum entropy. So Okay, let's pause for a second. I've been a bit fast in this part, but... I don't We are integrating over matrix. This phi is all possible fields. I'm, I'm being schematic because in principle you do this in, in, uh, in string theory. And if you read Sen's paper, it says integrating over string field uh, over string fields. So, I mean, it's all fields that you have in your theory. You need to decide how to define this integral. But in the end, already it, Sen is telling you which observable to compute. This observable, this operator, the web of this operator. Then it's up to you to define the integral and compute it. It's, uh, in principle, extremely complicated. But in the remaining 15 minutes, I would like to comment on how people have have been trying to compute that. Um, unless there are questions, I have been very fast in this last part. So from, from the gravity point of view, this formula is telling you to compute the value of this Wilson loop. Exactly. And if I think in holography, from the CFT point of view, yeah, very good. Wilson loop is a string, and I know how to compute it holographically. But here, do I know uh, holographic prescription for that operator in the CFT? It's a source. This is a source. It's not a dynamical. In the CFT, this is a source. I'm, I'm, coming, I'm coming to the CFT1 interpretation in the comments, and maybe we can, uh, we can discuss a bit more. I will try to somehow make the link with that. So, but before coming to some CFT1, uh, ADS2 is ADS2 CFT1. That's uh, why I have CFT1 in mind. But before doing that, let's see how far we can go in computing this gravitational entropy. So far, we are in what uh, Sen and collaborators, Atish Dabolkar, Samir, Murat, and others, called the macroscopic entropy. It's true we are computing this microcanonical partition function, but it's macroscopic because it, it's uh, a computation done in the uh, gravitational setup. 
We don't have uh, the, the microstates. We don't see microstates. So it's macroscopic from this point of view. Uh, we use this effective theory or string theory and uh, try to compute this. So what can be done? Let me just uh, comment a bit randomly on, the, on this. I don't want to be systematic now. But what could you do? In principle, first, check that the saddle point approximation works. But it's basically built in, is, what, is how we built this. If we take some semi-classical approximation, the semi-classical approximation is V1 going to infinity. I take the radius of ADS very large. OK, recover classical result. What we have discussed so far is the classical result. OK, this is one thing. Then you may want to say, OK, this is the saddle. I know what's the saddle. It's the uh, solution of the equations of motion, the classical equations of motion. Then I want to do, compute the first correction. So yesterday we saw that we can expand in the fluctuations. The first correction is quadratic in the fluctuations. It usually amounts to compute some functional determinant when you do Gaussian path integral. Uh, the quadratic term is, amounts to computing some functional determinant, but uh, it's this one loop determinants. It can be quite complicated. There may be many, many fields. Uh, here, the theory can be very complicated. So in principle, it's uh, so one loop, one loop computations. These one loop determinants can be done, let's say, can be done in some setup. So people in uh, supersymmetric setups, typically. So Ashok Sen with the collaborators has uh, lots of paper where some papers where he studies these one loop <laughs> corrections. And uh, there are different types of corrections that you may consider. So the massive fields will give rise to, are not really quantum because we can trade these massive fields for the higher derivative terms in the effective action. In the Wilsonian approach, we integrate out the, the massive fields. But the massless fields we really to to do the quantum path integral. So we need to do this one loop for massless fields. And this gives some log logarithmic corrections to the entropy. So if you start from a theory derivatives, is if you just take a theory with two derivatives, Einstein even even just pure Einstein-Hilbert term, and you consider the Schwarzschild solution, even without extremality, you can do some well-definite uh, quantum computations for some massless of freedom. You get some logarithmic terms, and the claim of is that these are non-ambiguous. They are fixed, and they must be computable. In the extreme case, you can do. You don't need really supersymmetry. Then with supersymmetry, things become maybe easier, but... Uh, there are Sen has results about these logarithmic terms. Just to tell you what they are, they should be something like entropy is area over 4 plus log of the area over always LP squared. So since the area over LP squared is big, these are subleading respect, with respect to this. Then there may be other suppressed terms like this, and so on. But uh, this one can be non-ambiguous and computable by one-loop computations. And in some cases, this has been done in some supersymmetric setup, but even in for care, uh, extreme care, and for Schwarzschild. And so Sen says, I, I have put some constraints on, uh, on quantum gravity. You give me your quantum gravity theory. I check if your quantum gravity theory predicts the correct, according to this definition, the correct log terms. And I think he's saying that some theories do and some others don't. Another thing that you may want to do is to, uh, that I will probably not have time, I'll take, it'll take a couple of minutes to do the comments about the CFT, five minutes to do the comments about the CFT, but before that, Another technique that you may use if, uh, if you have supersymmetry is to use supersymmetric localization to, you, to compute the gravitational path integral. So 
So I definitely don't have time to discuss this now. But uh, so lo supersymmetric localization is a technique or a phenomenon that uh, shows that the full pa complicated path integral, even the gravitational case sometimes, uh, definitely in quantum field theory, boils down to a much simpler integral because the field configurations that matter localize to some nice locus that is kind of simple. Some constant values of the scalar fields, for instance, something like that. So if you use this technique, this simplifies a lot. It's a technique that simplifies a lot the path integral. There are hundreds and hundreds of papers on this technique, so definitely I don't want to discuss it now. But you can try to apply it to the complicated problem of computing a quantum gravity path integral. Even if it's in ADS2, it's still complicated. And, uh, and uh, people have obtained very interesting results. If you want more information, just ask. It doesn't make sense to try to expand on this, but there are very encouraging results, although things may a priori look ill-defined. And finally, let's come a bit to the, to the end of the story, in a sense. So we started by asking, what are the microstates that uh, underlie the black hole entropy? So far, we, don't, we still don't really have a clue. We have found a way to compute the quantum entropy in, for these extremal black holes, better if, it is, if they are supersymmetric. Um, it's still in the gravitational theory. It's still a path integral over a lot of fields. We are not really seeing what are we counting. We are not counting states. It's not obvious that we are counting states. So in order to have a clue about this, so one idea, a very broad idea in string theory that was what inspired Strominger and Waffa in the original computations about black hole entropy in string theory is to think about supersymmetric black holes as arising from some brain setup, brain and string setup of the type that uh, Costas Bacchus was discussing, D1, D5 mm, setups uh, with, with brains and strings. So these carry their own degrees of freedom. And uh, there is a regime of the coupling constants in which gravity wins and uh, you form the black hole. There is another regime where there is no black hole and there are just these fluctuations of the brains. But the two regimes are equivalent if you have supersymmetry, so that you can reliably do the computation in one regime instead of the other if there is supersymmetry. So this is the idea of Strominger and Buffer. They did the theory, in a com the, the computation in some quantum field theory that was reproducing these degrees of freedom on the brain and uh, recovered the end, Bekenstein-Hockey entropy of some supersymmetric black